Number five. Okay, so there's one thing that I wanted to pop on and say before we get started um, that I really wanted to include and forgot, and that is that cults will always deny that they are a cult, of course. Um, they will make jokes about the idea that outsiders think that they're a cult. They think it is some sort of rite of passage um, because that must make them very exclusive and super spiritual. But they will deny that they are a cult. They will mock it. They will even wear t-shirts that say cult leader on it. Um, and this is basically just a reverse psychology tactic. But rest assured, they will not admit to being a cult. All day, every day, serving or gathering. Are you expected to attend all of these events? Um, do they encourage quitting school, um, work? Does your group or your church encourage you um, to think about whether or not it's God's will for you to, or to be a part of those things outside of the group? So <clears throat> cults will basically tie up every inch of your time. They will tie up every single minute, every hour every, of every day if they can of your time. Um, this will leave you no time to evangelize the lost. This will leave you no time to spend with your family and friends who may or may not be lost. Um, this will leave you no time to um, even research or read books on your own. This will leave you no, this will leave you time for nothing. This will leave you time to do, to only be with your church or with Again, using that term lightly. And I don't mean to, to say that air quotes. I don't mean to do that to offend people. I'm just saying that to say we are talking about cults today, right? Um, and so the idea is if you are attending, if you are part of a group that calls himself a church and all of these things are on the list, it, it is a cult. They will tie up all of your time. They will leave you no time for Mark 16, 15, which says we are to go out and evangelize, right? We are to go out and tell people the good news, the gospel. We are going to go out and do that. Um, Mark 16, 15 um, may not be a focal, a focus, or may not be even a thing at your church, like evangelizing the lost. It may not be a thing. If you are sent out to evangelize, it'll be evangelize and bring people in to our church or our group, but it will not be just tell people about Jesus and be content with that. Number four, excommunication, shunning, or disfellowshipping. So what happens when people leave your group or your church? Is the congregation encouraged to bless them on their, their journey with the Lord? Um, with a verse like Deuteronomy 31, 8, which says, But Adonai, it is he who will go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. So don't be afraid or downhearted. Or are you encouraged and or directed to cut off all communication with the people who leave because these people according to your church are carnal selfish disloyal and acting against God's will etc there are two types of believers um, that we see in Scripture that other believers are admonished to um, avoid and that's cult leaders slash false prophets same thing I use it interchangeably um, because cults are teaching a false doctrine um, or believers who are involved in sexual sin or cult leaders right now regarding uh, believers involved in sexual sin 1st Corinthians 5 1 tells us about a man living with his um, his stepmother it is widely reported the scripture says that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles a man is living with his father's wife. Paul continues in verse four saying, when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus with my spirit and with the power of the Lord Jesus, turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now regarding cult leaders, Romans 16, 17, 18 says, 
I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put snares alongside the teaching in which you have been trained. Keep away from them, for men like these are not serving our Lord the Messiah, but their own belly. By smooth chalk and flattery, they deceive the innocent. Unless the excommunicated individual has committed one of these two things, you have to ask yourself why your church is has asked you to dis or to um, disfellowship or excommunicate or shun. Number three, communal living. As mentioned in the definition I gave earlier, this is one indication that you may be in a cult. Now, this may seem like a no-brainer to some people. Some people may look at this and say, well, duh, of course living communally is a sign they're in a cult, but not necessarily. You know, we do see in scripture in Acts that there was a time, a, 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 an instance, which is um, descriptive and not prescriptive, uh, meaning it is not a prescribed thing that the Bible is telling us, but a described, it's des describing to us what was happening. There's a small section where people did for a season live in that way, right? Um, but this is again, not prescriptive. This is descriptive. Living communally um, simply allows for deeper indoctrination into the cult's extra biblical book. And we'll get to why or how people end up, people who would not normally live, think of living communally, end up living communally. So um, again, it allows for deeper indoctrination into the cult's extra biblical book, um, new ways to study the Bible, new ways uh, to, in, they'll present new ways to interpret the Bible. Um, and lastly, new ways to live out applications of scriptures so that you can follow them as they follow Christ. All right, um, barring from Paul. So after all, you know, they, after all, they now have more intimate insight into what makes you tick, as it were, right? So it's a rare occurrence. Um, one thing to note, it's a rare occurrence that cults will command or force people to live communally. That's typically not how it happens. Um, what typically happens is um, there's subtlety behind it. So week after week, you may hear conversations and or sermons from the pulpit about how not living communally is an act of selfishness or a spirit of individualism, um, rebellion, immaturity, lack of spirituality, except lack of the Holy Spirit, etc. So that's what you'll hear from the pulpit. Won't be directed at you, like directed at you necessarily, but you will hear things like that from the pulpit. Um, uh, those who do not live, who are part of the church or the group, who do not live communally will be looked upon as um, outside of the circle. Like, you know, you're not part of the cool kids, the cool kids who are super committed. So you'll be looked at as outside of the circle, as it were, um, looked upon or looked upon as like um, unwilling to die to self uncommitted, selfish, carnal, um, because you're choosing, because you're choosing not to align yourself to God's will for not, not to align yourself to God's will by not being of one mind, right? Uh, not being unity in mind, those sorts of phrases um, with the mission of the church. So see how that works? Disobeying the mission of their church or group automatically means you are disobeying God. So then, it is by very subtle, indirect manipulation of this type that people will actually sign up for living communally, even though their conscience might be bothered by it. Number two, what is the fruit that you are seeing in this church? What is the fruit? Galatians 5, 22, 19, 23 tells us, it is perfectly evident what the old nature does. It expresses itself in sexual immorality, impurity and indecency, involvement with the occult and with drugs, in feuding, fighting, becoming jealous and getting angry, in selfish ambition, factionalism, intrigue and envy, in drunkenness, orgies and things like these. I warn you now as I've warned you before, 
those who do such things have no share in the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. Nothing in Torah stands against such things. So please note, okay, as I just read Galatians 5.22, that the faithfulness in this verse is not talking about faithfulness to your church. That is not what he's talking about. He is talking about faithfulness to Christ. And that's one thing to remember with cults. Um, things that are typically talked about as to Christ is to the church. Um, making disciples is turned into disciples after them instead of disciples after Christ in cults. So it's always, um, they, they, they stand themselves up uh, right next to God, um, just like what we talked about earlier, right? When it was kind of like, well, the mission of the church is God's will. So if you disobey us and God's in, in the mission, then you're disobeying God directly. So they think of themselves as having the same authority as God. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So what fruit are you seeing? Are you seeing the fruit of the spirit? Um, or are you seeing feuding? Are you seeing factionalism? Like I said, there's the, the, the carnals over here and the us over here. Are you seeing infighting? Are you seeing um, jealousy? Um, are you seeing anger? Um, what types of things are you seeing? Or are you seeing joy, right? That's a telltale sign joy is one of the hugest fruits of the spirit that you will find will be lacking in this type of cult it will be joyless people will put on a show and they will give lip service to joy but joy will be replaced with fear oftentimes fear of not measuring up to god uh, fear of not measuring up to um the the church the, the church's standards fear flogging and self-abasement will dominate um will be the fruit um, that is one thing you can bet that will be the fruit. The fruit will not be joy, peace. Peace will be gone. Again, replaced with fear, flogging, um, you know, goodness, all those things, faithfulness, self-control, humility will be replaced with self-righteousness, will be replaced with doing good works for God, will be replaced with earning. Moving on, last but not least, number one. A different Jesus a different gospel so this is so important it will not be obvious it will not be obvious to even seasoned Christians it may not be obvious um, Matthew 24 22 through 27 says for there will appear false messiahs and false prophets performing great miracles amazing things so as to fool even the chosen, if possible. There, I've told you in advance. So if people say to you, listen, he's in the desert, don't go. Or look, he's hidden away in a secret room. Don't believe it. For when the son of man does come, it will be like lightning that flashes out of the east and fills the sky to the western horizon. So right there, you already know that when Jesus come back, comes back he will not come back performing all these signs and wonders right so signs I'm saying this to say signs cannot be a litmus test for um, whether or not someone is speaking the truth of God's word whether or not they're saved whether or not they're be filled they be filled with the spirit the Bible does not teach us that okay so the mere we've already gone over what the fruits of the spirit are and signs and wonders wasn't in there so the mere idea that doing something is speaking God I mean is evidence of some special anointing or special gifting or revelation new revelation it should be a red flag to us um, why well any doctrine that teaches that doing stuff to get something from God is heresy because everything we get from God is a gift and we aren't earning anything um, but you see pride will not allow a legalistic cult, <clears throat> excuse me, to accept grace by faith alone, right? Um, so um, cult leaders will often talk about some way to salvation, um, gifts and or righteousness that either excludes Jesus entirely, okay, excludes God entirely, or includes Jesus 
plus other stuff, right? Plus other things. What is the gospel? Colossians 1, 19, I'll start there. For it pleased God to have his full being live in his son and through his son to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through him, through having his son shed his blood by being executed on a stake. In other words, you who at one time were separated from God and had a hostile attitude toward him because of your wicked deeds, he has now reconciled in the son's physical body through his death in order to present you holy and without defect or reproach before himself, provided, of course, that you continue in your trusting, grounded and steady, and don't let yourselves be moved away from the hope offered in the good news you heard. This is the good news that has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. There you have it, my friends. That is the good news. <clears throat> if you believe that you, um, well, first, let me just talk about this a little bit. This idea of more. I want to talk about the idea of more. Um, oftentimes, we can find ourselves maybe in a dry season, um, or we feel like it's a dry season with the Lord, or um, maybe we're going to a church that we feel like would dig deeper into the Word, and again maybe we're just feeling distant from the Lord or something um, and so we started praying about more wanting more asking God for more 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 of his spirit that's one prayer that we pray a lot and I don't think sometimes we don't think about when we're praying that what we're actually praying for so when we tell God we want more what are we actually saying are we saying that what God has already given us is not enough um, and maybe we're not thinking that you know directly like consciously but maybe sub um, subconsciously right we're thinking we want more because um, I would argue that there is uh, some discontentment there in our hearts some unresolved discontentment um, that we have in this season that we're walking with the Lord and um, I would caution our prayer for more now if we want to say God I want to just be closer to you um, bring me draw me close to you and pray that prayer and I'm not telling you how to pray I'm just saying I think when we pray um, for more um, we're asking for more so I think Satan uses our discontented hearts or our dry seasons to present us with something that looks like more and a counterfeit of what we may have envisioned in our minds more is so he presents us with something that seems like more if you're going to a church maybe they're not digging deep into the word you might uh, a cult cults are always mixing and confusing scripture i mean they like to dig deep into the old testament and pull things out from there and apply it to the new and you know kind of throw a bunch of scriptures at you and they like I said they reinterpret and do all of these things and so they present it to you on a platter like it's some new revelation from God so if you're asking for more Satan will work through cults and give you more but not more of what you want what you want is a refreshing of the Holy Spirit what you want is um, to feel Lord Lord's or, or to be um, you know present with the Lord you want to be in his presence you want maybe at some point you've had some experiences with the Holy Spirit and you know where you felt his presence and you were emotionally like overwhelmed just with his presence and you long for that and maybe you're going through a season you you or maybe you're going through a dry season or maybe you think that every time you enter into God's presence that is going to happen and so what Satan does is he is primed and ready my friends to give us more of God's Spirit we cannot get more of the Holy Spirit okay he the whole the Holy Spirit he is a person okay he that's it he is a person he, nobody can get more of Rita they can't be like I got one this Rita and then another Rita and there's no clones you know just one so the Holy Spirit is one so asking for more 
of the Holy Spirit. What are you asking for? Just be mindful of what you're asking for. That's all I'm saying. Um, I'm saying let's be thinking about our prayers and being, like I said, like good Bereans and doing our research and thoughtful prayer into these things. Um, if things start to sound funny, if you start hearing language you haven't heard, if you start hearing stuff about realms and kingdoms and militia talk and dying, a lot of dying, and this is not a good sign. And if you are attending a church like that, I'm going to tell you that either it's either a cult or it's some very unhealthy teaching happening there. And I would encourage you to begin to um, really just study the word for yourself. Don't read their book. Study the word. I would encourage you to leave. That's just me. I would encourage you to leave because if you're watching this video and you already are kind of feeling funny or feeling some kind of way about the churches you're attending, like maybe you checked off some of these boxes on this list. And if you have, I'm going to say, I'm going to encourage you to leave because that means that God is all, the Holy Spirit's already dealing with your heart in the matter of your church and these unhealthy things that you're seeing. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to encourage you to step out in faith and leave. Now, your group will try to convince you or you've already been convinced that leaving this church is against God's will, right? You've already been conditioned to think that if you are part of a cult, chances are they've already talked to you. I mean, you've already had this conditioning about leaving is against God's will. It is that, my friend, is not of God. Um, I, I want to give you this verse, Psalm 37, 23, 24. Okay, and I want to encourage you with this. If you are in a dysfunctional or if you're in a cult and you are thinking of leaving, but you think that you will be cursed by God or you will be outside of God's will. Psalm 37 says, 23 says, Adonai directs a person's steps and he delights in his way. He may stumble, but he won't fall headlong for Adonai holds him by the hand. There is no contingency there before and after that verse. It does not say, unless you stay with this group, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Like God's going to let go of your hand if you leave. No, that is satanic. It is heresy. It's from the pit of hell. So if you are thinking of leaving this group, but you feel like you won't be in God's will if you leave, but you know there's some unhealthy practices, step out in faith, leave. That's what I'm going to tell you. It doesn't matter what your title is, what your position, what your, none of that matters. What matters is your soul. And um, you don't want to be in that group on the last day saying, but Lord, I prophesied in your name and I did all these works in your name. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Right. Um, so you don't, I don't want you to be in that group. I, you don't want to be in that group, I'm sure. So if the Lord is tugging on your heart, that something is not right. Do not ignore him. Okay. I pray that this has been a blessing to someone today. I pray that God will continue to guide your steps. I pray that you would not be afraid and you would not be filled with fear, but that you will be filled with the fruits of the spirit. Um, I pray that you are safe and well during this time of this plague. And I pray that your family is well. I pray blessings um, for you. And um, yeah, I hope that this was helpful. Thank you for stopping by. All right. Bye.